So that's slide two. Okay. Oops. <laughs> there we go. Good. Okay. So um, as I was saying, yeah. Thanks. To, thanks to Jerome for letting me um, talk about this project as well. But I, I'm here in a very inofficial capacity, hence just the first name and the mystery presenter status. And I want to reiterate that I'm not representing my institution or its opinions. And I'm also going to speak a little more vaguely than I might otherwise. Um, and I want to try and focus on some more general points rather than aspects particular to my institutional setting. Um, next slide. So um, I first uh, attended No Time to Wait 2 uh, in, in Vienna, Austria in, in 2017. Uh, Vienna is my hometown, and I only found out about the conference a day or two before, so it was really a matter of luck that I was able to attend. Um, I don't have an AV background. I studied archival science in a traditional historian archivist master's program, and uh, my first no time to wait, there was a lot I did not understand or could not fully follow. Uh, but I gained some background knowledge, and I became a little bit braver in exploring the command line, if nothing else. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to shout out uh, Ashley Brewer's presentation in Vienna and her excellent blog and guides, which I refer to regularly. Uh, next slide. So, um, again, as I mentioned, no AV background, but I nevertheless uh, became the primary person responsible for the AV collections in the archives of my work. And I first became aware that we had these odd NSD files, uh, which will subsequently be referred to as Sardiva files, um, when a colleague who left for another institution alerted me to them. Um, these files recorded meetings and usually consist of a static video and multiple audio channels uh, representing different simultaneous translations. They also contained meeting agendas and speaker lists which were very useful to us because um, when we would receive a request for these videos from the archives, often people wanted to see a specific speech from a specific speaker. So um, these files, they could not be opened or played by conventional players. Um, and even the software that created them offered no method to export all audio channels and the metadata associated with the files like in a single package. Um, while a video content is not particularly interesting, um, these files are nevertheless considered a value for the organization and they have a permanent retention. So based on this, it was clear that they should be migrated and I'm, I'm happy to discuss why not emulation in the QA um, if someone wants to come for me. But um, despite their complexity, um, because they claim to be NSD files, I thought it would be relatively easy to migrate them, especially armed with some FF improviser scripts. Um, however, after my initial tests and some pleas I sent out on Twitter, which some of you responded to, um, it was clear that these files uh, would be more complex and challenging to migrate than expected. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Oops. Uh, uh, sorry. Oh my God, I was speaking on that slide. Continue one further. This is the problem. Switches. Hold on. Uh, sorry. Uh, where am I? Um, no, please go back one more. Go back to the slide five. Okay. Good. Okay. Sorry. So, um, as I said, in 2019, I tried to transcode, uh, transcode them using some scripts from FM Improviser. But I soon realized this was way out of my league, um, among other reasons, because the audio codex wasn't recognized. Um, when No Time to Wait 4 took place in Budapest, Hungary in December 2019, um, it was just a few months after my first transcoding attempts. And I saw that as an opportunity to liaise with people who are knowledgeable and, and gain access to further information. Um, I did not find an immediate solution. And, and frankly, I wasn't expecting to. Um, but it, it, um, it helped me to know better what I was looking for in a potential solution. For example, something that would, uh, that would package everything in a Matroska wrapper. Um, and I also learned uh, what providers like Media Area are offering. Um, so learning that other institutions were sponsoring feature development and that might meet a specific need, but would also be available to the wider community uh, showed a potential way forward for me. Um, and 
I just want to say, you know, we benefit personally and professionally from free open source software, but we all know that it's not free as in beer. Um, so it's important, it's important to support like cross projects uh, when the opportunity arises. So next slide. Um, so soon after I returned from No Time to Wait For, um, I began surveying the digital holdings of the archives and um, including creating a digital asset registry, which was more or less modeled on the information asset registries um, outlined by the UK National Archives. Um, the Stardiva files were included sort of as one asset in the registry. And once the registry was completed, I, I performed a risk assessment, giving the assets a risk score uh, based on the following areas of risk. So um, risk to being able to find, to open, to work with, to understand, risks to their persistence, and risks to trust. And the Stardiva were, uh, files were flagged based on the, the risks, especially to persistence and, and the ability to open. Um, and I recommended taking action on them based on their institutional value. So once that was established, whenever there was an opportunity to nominate a project for funding, I suggested a project to convert the files. Um, and uh, using the risk analysis as a justification. So um, in the scheme of things, this took a long time, right? I first identified the issue uh, back in 2019 um, and it took years, but the project finally received funding in, in the fourth quarter of 2021. And um, as Shahom will tell you much more about, uh, it was carried out in the first half of 2022. So last slide. Okay, great. Um, so, um, no time to wait effect part three, paying it forward. Um, thanks to knowledge I gained from previous no time to wait conferences, I was able to make sure that we put out a statement of work that aimed to target open solutions. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize also that we didn't have a specific solution or service provider in mind and, and that wouldn't have been allowed, right? But we worked to frame things in a way that encouraged open solutions and discouraged proprietary ones. Some of the language included phrases like well-documented and commonly used file formats and codexes, uh, use free open source software wherever possible, and provide documentation of scripts and customizations. This language aimed to make sure that we did not get stuck with a black box again, but rather the opposite. Um, I'll be honest and admit, I, I still don't know a lot of, about AV preservation and transcoding, but having the documentation means that someone else who knows more could better follow what we did in the future. Um, and um, so I'm going to stop my part of the presentation here and hand over to Jerome. But um, as I said, um, uh, please feel free to ask me also questions at the end. And, um, and I mean, thanks a million times to Jerome and Media Area for this wonderful work that we were able to do with them. I mean, that they did, right? They, they did the work. <laughs> we were able to support it. I'm very glad about that. So uh, the main issue, uh, we, will part, uh, we will talk about the technical part now. So a lot of uh, NSV files is created by the proprietary software from Stardiva. So the content was playable only on Windows by a modified version and VLC and metadata just by one tool, their tool. So we say, oh, VLC, VLC is copyleft. So it is very useful you know, in theory you have a source code available because uh, in open source you have copy copy free. You are not op um, it is not mandatory to to keep the open source version. But VLC is copyleft. It is mandatory to provide the source when you modify that. But it is the theory in practice. No source code. So you have a modified version of VLC without source code. So it is open source but without respecting the license. And the metadata. We are in, uh, the, 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 the client was interested in the metadata because it, it is about the location, the date, the time, how, uh, who is speaking, and so on. But there is only their tool, which is able to read the, uh, the, the metadata, and it was impossible to automate. There is no export, so you are totally locked. You have the information, but locked. So 
for, for the, um, the tools themselves, we were not able to do anything, so we try with the files. It is NSV. NSV was very well known 20 years ago now. Um, it is no more, um, no, no more used, but for them it was used. And uh, NSV is um, as an open uh, documentation, so it would be great, we check that, but actually, uh, no. Because the way they, they use the NSV, it is a bit weird. NSV can only do one video, one audio, but we expect eight audio track. We have eight different uh, interpretation. NSV has a, a specification how to store metadata, but it was not used there. The metadata is opaque in, in these files. So there is a, a standard way to do uh, metadata. They don't use them, they hide everything. So it was not so easy to just extract the information. So we decided to go to the reverse engineering. It is very slow to develop. There is no guarantee of results, but we have no other choice. The tools, we cannot use them. The files directly, it is not possible to just look at the specification because they don't use uh, the standard way to use in, uh, to, to do in uh, NSV. So we'll, we look in the files. It is a bit, we can understand. Okay, it is AVC for video, it is AAC for audio. Oh, it seems easy. But no, it was not so easy because it is hacked. Like NSV, it is used in a specific way. Uh, AVC for video and AAC for audio was also used in a very specific way. And for the metadata, it was just very opaque part. So it was difficult, but uh, we, we, di we did the reverse engineering. For AVC, for the video, it was not too complicated. We, uh, we were able to demix it, to fix a bit, because they, they, um, they record at 23 frames per second, but the hardware was doing, oh, I, I put 25 frames per second in the B-stream. So there are some uh, synchronization issues sometimes when we demix. Also, their tool is recording some, uh, with a key frame, the, the, the first frame we have to decode every 10 seconds, and sometimes they just start in the middle, so we lose some content. But okay, it is life, we do without that. For the audio, it, it was where well. it, it, it is supposed to be eight tracks, but actually it was AAC with eight channels. So, okay, it is a word, because it is like left, right, center, back, and so on, and then they do uh, they use this AAC, but it, they do eight mono content. And uh, it was uh, also in a different, a different way to store, and FFmpeg fails to decode them. Um, we, so we, don't, we didn't use only FFmpeg, we also use FAD. FAD is a, another decoder, it is a free audio uh, uh, AAC decoder. We need to, to modify a bit the B stream, so we had the solution ever to modify uh, a FAD, because it is open source, or to modify a bit the B-Stream. We took the easy way, we modified a bit the B-Stream. It was just one byte. Um, so now we knew a bit, uh, a bit uh, how it is. We, we got a different solution. We could improve FFmpeg for the playback, but with a eight channel audio, uh, and we want to have eight tracks, it will be very hacky to put that in FFmpeg and in, on, uh, in players not based on FFmpeg, it will be not playable. So we, uh, we, we got another solution. We decode the AAC, we do some adaptation uh, and we split eight channel to eight tracks and we re-encode and for that, after that, we uh, mix everything in Matroska and AVC, not modified, slightly modified, and eight AAC uh, content. So this is the choice we did. We do everything like that. We also detect the silent tracks because there was no metadata saying, oh, uh, yes, we, you have eight channels, eight tracks for that, but maybe you have only one or two interpretation for the, a specific day. There was no metadata, so we had to create this metadata. Um, for the metadata, it was very opaque, so we did a lot of reverse engineering. We faced the bug of the tools, so when we were not understanding why uh, the, 
opaque metadata, we can hack, find how we, we store um, the metadata. And for one file, it was not working. We manually check the, uh, the file with their tools. It was not working, so a bit weird. Um, but we finally succeeded to, to extract the speaker, the timestamp, and so on, and we converted them to Matroska chapters. So it is an example about what uh, we succeeded to find. Um, there is a lot of things when we, we do the trace like that. Um, it was not, uh, we didn't succeed to understand all the bytes, but we were interested in specific uh, content, like the speaker names, the timestamps, and so on. So we were happy to be able to find what we were looking for. So maybe there are other content, but it was uh, decided that it is not so important, so we stopped to try the reverse engineering. So um, I will talk a bit uh, about the time we spent on, uh, on that. 80% uh, of the files, it was very easy to uh, reverse engineer, but other part of the files, it was a bit more complicated. So we had to process the files um, several times, and sometimes it takes a, a week to process everything um, because we didn't get um, we didn't get an, a very powerful computer for that and so on, and we spend a lot of time to to repeat the process to modify a bit on our algorithm. So reverse engineering, it is a solution, but it is a slow one. With that, we also learned that uh, in practice, you think that your files are perfect, but uh, yes, ninety nine percent of the files are usually perfect, but we can, uh, you can have some problems. Uh, in practice, in this uh, repository, we found 1% of the file with bad content. It was not so problematic. It was just uh, 0,01% uh, of some missing things. But uh, when you try to decode that, uh, there is a problem when uh, there you have um, an invalid packet or just a correct um, audio packet. You have to understand to, to know where is the, the problem, so you can document a bit uh, where, where are the issue in your files. And um, at the end, we also detected that some um, content were totally um, impossible to decode. So you were thinking that you, you have a file, you think it is, uh, you have the content, and you store it. And then when you try to play, uh, to play it, you see that, oh, no, you don't have the content. So now it is easier. We, we cannot retrieve everything, but we know what is uh, available and what is not available. For information, the, all the list of the tools we use, we use MediaInfo, but we adapted it for uh, reading the metadata, for doing the um, uh, reverse engineering. We use FAD, we use FFmpeg, we use uh, also uh, the FDK, so the Franauer uh, SDK for AAC for encoding. We use MKV Toolnix for, uh, for the, um, the mixing uh, and for the chapters and so on. And we created the Leaf SD project, uh, which is a dedicated command line for automation. So all the glue between all the different tools. So, so Mario, but you want to take a photo? <laughs> Um, so now about that is don't think that because you have the files, you store them, or it is great, it is perfect. No, your files are not perfect until you are sure that you tested every frame. So it is not only just, oh, I, I see that it is AVC, it is AAC, oh, I can decode them. Yes, but you need to, to check the whole files, else you are not sure about the quality of the files. Sometimes you have just a few seconds of content missing. Um, and for that, you need to automate and to uh, to check every bit and every, uh, every second, every frame of, of uh, the content you have. If you don't do that, you don't know what you have in reality. Um, and yeah, everything we, we use open source tools and LiveSD. The glue between all the tools is also uh, open source. So we we did that for the people, and now. It is there. It is uh, also open source. We share our, our experience. So if uh, you want to check that, it is on our website, uh, LiveSD. There is a GitHub also, and so on. So everything is open. That's all for me. If you have questions. 
Thank you so much, Vala. And our super presenter. Thank you. We have time for one question. Hi, my name is Zhuja. I'm from the Open Society Archives Budapest. I would like to ask you what were these NS3 files uh, containing? So what were the files uh, about? Uh, uh, <laughs> In practice, I didn't have access to so many files because uh, it is um, content with some rights uh, on, on that. So uh, I, I used to, to send my code and it, uh, the, um, uh, the content was on site and I never had access to that. So I don't know in practice. <laughs> so I have some, some parts, yes, I know, but very few seconds in practice. So it is also respecting uh, that uh, we, we can accept it sometimes it is just uh, we don't have access to the file so it is more difficult. We send code, it is tested and we have uh, the, the results and we need to, we, we have some metadata. So I, I know the metadata but I will not say what it is. <laughs> I, I have some mysterious. speaker names, <laughs> very uh, but in practice we respect when it is not possible to have the content, we, we find a solution to, to, to manage that. So I will not answer, and actually for a lot of things I don't know. Thank you so much. There, um, Oh, very quick. Um, very quick. So uh, some parts are open source, but for the cost it is not open source. Yeah. If you've got more questions for Jerome, please, you'll be here today, tomorrow, I think, as well. I am there, there. today, so this evening, please, tomorrow. If you no want problem. to know more about the costs, just order something, other secret, mysterious things that you don't want to tell me. <laughs> it's good. Thank you, uh, Liz, still there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerome. Thank you.